Okay, so yesterday we were talking about um, what an atom is, what it was made of. Okay, we're going to continue on with that. We're also going to look at who came up with what kind of ideas, okay, things of that nature. All right, guys, you do have to have something open on your desk. Okay, you can't sit there with nothing. All right, um, so what we are uh, going to go over here first is probably the most important person in terms of the idea of the atom, at least, and that is John Dalton. He's the one who came up with the atomic theory. All right. His points still hold true today, okay, for the most part. Um, and then we'll look at a couple of other discoveries that came along after Dalton, okay, and a couple of other very important people and what their discoveries were and how that kind of changed the way we thought about matter. All right. Uh, so John Dalton is the person, like we said, who came up with the atomic theory. Okay, and the atomic theory starts out with Democritus's idea. All elements are composed of tiny, indivisible particles called atoms. Okay, not invisible. All right. I mean, yes, we can't see them; they're very small. But they, you know, if we could get a microscope, they would be visible. Okay. Uh, well, a powerful enough microscope. Right. It's indivisible, which means you can't split them. Now, is that partially true, partially false? Partially true. Okay. There's no natural means by which you split an atom. Okay. But it can be done artificially. I mean, that's how we make nuclear reactors that generate electricity, and it is also how we uh, make nuclear bombs that create destruction. Okay? Now, the process for each of them is essentially the same. Okay? We look at big atoms, and we shoot smaller particles at them until they break. Okay? It's not an actual cutting of the atom. It's actually a shattering of it. Okay? The bigger an atom is, tends to be the weaker it is held together. Right? And so they break more easily when you strike them with something. I'll show you that in a few minutes. Okay? The second point of Dalton's atomic theory is that atoms of the same element are identical. Absolutely identical. If I have 10 atoms of oxygen sitting in a row and they're big enough for me to see, okay, I would not be able to tell them apart. They would all have eight protons, eight neutrons, and eight electrons. There would be no way to tell them apart. They have to be identical because they all have the same properties. Everyone follow me there? Okay. And then by the same token, atoms of different elements must be different. All right. When I look at an atom of carbon, okay, it is significantly different in that it only has six protons in it. Okay. It only has uh, six neutrons and six electrons. Okay. Everybody with me so far? All right. The third thing that Dalton came up with as an idea, okay, was that atoms of different elements can combine with one another in simple whole number ratios, okay, to form compounds. What he means by that is you never find a compound that only has half of an atom in it. Okay, you guys with me there? You can't have half of an atom in something because if you do, what have you done to that atom? You've split it, okay? And we can't do that, okay, in a chemical reaction. Chemical reactions are not going to cause, all right, a nuclear uh, explosion to occur. Everybody with me there? That's what he means by the simple whole number ratios. So if you look at something simple like water, okay, water is H2O. How many hydrogens in it? Two. How many oxygens in it? One. All right? They're always a whole number. You never see a compound written like this. Right? Have you ever seen a compound with a fraction in it? It's because it doesn't happen that way. All right? You can't have half of an atom. Okay? You just can't. It doesn't, doesn't go in there. All right? um, and then the fourth thing. Chemical reactions occur when atoms are separated, joined, or rearranged. All right. So he's saying that chemical reactions don't involve a changing of the atoms. They involve changing of who they're with. All right. So I, if I had water and I separated it, I would then have hydrogen and oxygen. All right. If I had two a uh, elements, let's say sodium and chlorine, and I put them together, okay, I would have sodium chloride. All right. Table salt. All right. Those kind of things. I can separate them. I can join them, or I can have several things in there and have all of the atoms rearrange each it themselves and create new compounds. All right. I'm not creating new things. This fourth point was the death of alchemy. All right. In discovering that in a chemical reaction you are not going to change an element, that put to, to rest the idea that you could change lead into gold. All right. You cannot physically change an atom from one atom to another in a chemical reaction. All right. 
And that was the problem that the alchemists had. They didn't understand how atoms worked, and they could see that when they mixed two things together, they got different stuff at the end. What they didn't realize is it was a rearrangement of what they already had. They hadn't actually changed the elements that they were working with. All right, everybody follow me there? Okay, so the fourth point was kind of putting to rest alchemy and being able to transmute one thing into another. Should you know those four points? Yes, they are important, okay? And because there are four of them, they lend themselves very nicely to a multiple choice question on a unit exam, which of the following is not part of Dalton's atomic theory. Okay, something along those lines. So make sure you know those, they're important, especially three and four, because they talk about what goes on in chemical reactions, and that's going to be the second half of the unit. We'll constantly be referring back to those two points. Okay. All right, now, Dalton's atomic theory, people looked at it and they said, well, it all sounds good, but what does an atom look like? And Dalton didn't really have an answer for that. He said, well, they're too small, I can't see them. All right, it's not like I can just hook up a microscope and, and stare at this stuff and see the individual particles. It doesn't work that way. Now, at the time Dalton was working, okay, nobody knew about protons, nobody knew about neutrons, nobody knew about electrons yet, but they had this idea that, you know, things combine and things can be separated and things can rearrange. The most naturally occurring shape is the sphere. So it made sense to think that atoms probably looked like a sphere. Okay, they looked like a ball. So that's what he said. Dalton's model was called the solid sphere. Okay, he said, this is what atoms look like. They're a ball. Right? And it was fine for the time because nobody knew any better. Okay, made sense. The sun was a sphere, the moon was a sphere, the earth was a sphere. Everybody liked that. Seemed to be a kind of a common theme in, in nature. So that's what they said they looked like. All right. Here's the thing that happens in science. We keep an idea until we discover something that disproves it. Okay? So the solid sphere idea stayed a long time until we started discovering that there were other things that had to be part of the atom when we observe the behavior of materials. Okay? Uh, as an example, when your parents went to school, okay, they were probably told that all living things could fit into two kingdoms. They were either plants or animals. Right? That idea hung on even after we knew full well that there were things out there that didn't really fit the bill of either one of those two things. Okay? Now, we group life into five different kingdoms. Okay? You've got plants, you've got animals, okay? you've got protists, which are single-celled okay, eukaryotic organisms, you've got um, the monorins, which are like bacteria and viruses and things like that, and then you've got the fungi. All right? Now, for the longest time, people said that fungi were plants. Right? Why did they say that? Well, they grew out of the ground. Plants grow out of the ground, so they're a plant. Right? What do all plants also do? Okay, make nutrients. What process do they all carry out? Photosynthesis. Fungus don't. Okay? Fungus are incapable of carrying out photosynthesis. They're not plants. That was the, the thing that said, look, we can't keep putting fungus in the plant kingdom. They're not plants. They don't do the thing that all plants are supposed to do. Sure, they grow out of the ground. That's fine, but they grow out of other things, too. They grow out of your feet. They grow out of your scalp. Okay? You're not going to plant a seed for an apple tree and have it grow out of there. Okay? It's not going to work that way. But a fungus can do it. Okay? The fungus that's athlete's foot grows from your feet. Okay? The, the fungus that causes dandruff grows on your scalp. Right? They're not a plant. Everybody follow me there? We found something out and we said, look, this doesn't fit anymore. We have to change the way we do something or change the way we think about something. And it's the same for the atom. As we made new discoveries, we had to change what we thought the atom looked like. All right, first guy to come along that caused one of these changes was a guy named J.J. Thompson. He discovered that atoms contain small negatively charged particles okay, that he called electrons. Okay. He discovered this um, because he was working with chemical reactions and he discovered that in some chemical reactions an electric current could be produced. Now, the only way for an electric current to be produced when two things are mixed together is for a charged particle to move through the wire. Okay, And so he said, well, there has to be charged particles in this material. Maybe it's part of the atoms. We're going to call those moving charged particles electrons because they generate electricity. Made sense. All right. So because he found these charged particles, Dalton's solid sphere model didn't fit anymore because Dalton's solid sphere model didn't explain where these charged particles came from. 
Okay? So we said, I'm going to keep the solid sphere idea, but I'm going to say that there's negative charges stuck or embedded in the surface of this solid sphere. And that's because they're only on the surface, they can fall off. And when they fall off, they can travel through a wire and make a current, and it all kind of made sense. All right? So he came up with the plum pudding model, because apparently that's kind of like what plum pudding looks like. I don't know. I've never had it. Okay, I assume it's like pudding with plums in it. Okay, so that's kind of what it looks like. Okay, so you got these things that are stuck in there, only loosely attached to the surface. Okay, and that idea was good for a short time. But as more and more people were doing studies on matter, we started discovering that there have to be other things. Okay, the big problem with this is if there's negative charges on here, why isn't the atom negatively charged? There must be something else in there because people knew atoms are electrically neutral. So if you've got electrical uh, negative charges, you must also have positive charges. Okay? So they started coming up with kind of other ideas and they said, all right, there's uh, these negative charges on here and then the rest of the, of the atom, the solid sphere is positively charged and that kind of balances everything out. Yeah, so-so. Okay? People said, okay, maybe we want to have electrons that can move and then have positively charged stuff in the middle. People were okay with that, except the more they studied, the more they realized that protons had to be extraordinarily heavy to account for how heavy materials were. And that didn't seem to make sense either. All right? So the idea of the proton and the neutron came along. Okay, and that really got things going. Once people realized that atoms were made of three different things, okay, there was all kinds of ideas about what an atom must look like. Right? The key thing here is that people didn't realize that atoms could be very, very small. Okay? They were still picturing these big things right, that took up a lot of space. But in reality, what we know now is that the atom is mostly empty space. The nucleus is very small compared to the area the entire atom takes up because the electrons occupy this very large volume that surrounds the nucleus. Right? And it took a really smart guy to come up with an experiment to prove that. And in fact, it wasn't what he was trying to prove. He proved it by accident. Like all great scientific discoveries, he proved it by accident. Okay, so these are a couple of the other ideas here. Okay, we discovered the protons, which were positive. James Chadwick, okay, he's the one who discovered the protons. Okay, neutrons came along shortly thereafter. Okay, um, then this guy named Rutherford came along. Okay, and Rutherford was trying to prove how big the atom was. All right, so what he did is he set up um, an apparatus that looks like this. Okay, he took this. Um, essentially like an x-ray machine, okay? And he directed a beam of x-rays towards this foil that was made of gold, okay? So it was like tin foil, but made of gold, because gold atoms are heavy, and they figured that those would be better to use, okay? So he directed these, these x-rays at the gold foil, and then he put a ring of photographic film, essentially, around the outside. Now, I know you guys are of the generation where you've never used a, a camera that had this stuff in it. Cameras used to have stuff called film in them, okay? And when it got exposed to light, it would change and turn white, essentially, okay? So that's what he put around here, because x-rays are a form of light. Now, what he figured was, if I shoot these x-rays at this gold foil, and atoms are really big, all the rays are just going to come back, okay? If atoms are really small, they'll all get through, right? Neither one of those two things happened. The, atom, the, the beams all scattered, okay? which told him I wasn't right on either one of these. Atoms are made up of a dense nucleus and a lot of empty space. There's space in between these atoms. They can't be packed tightly together okay, and have no space in between them. That's what people had a hard time sort of picturing. If something is solid, how can there be spaces? Right? I mean, that means that if, if I hold up a piece of wood in front of me, light should come through it. Okay? Well, obviously that's not the way it works. Okay? But this thin gold foil experiment actually proved that there is space in between the atoms. Okay? This is what proved the nuclear model. Okay? So this was the proof.
that the atom contained a dense nucleus and then an area where there were electrons around. Okay? This is essentially what happened. Here's the gold foil. These are the atoms of gold. Okay? All these circles here are atoms of gold. So the x-rays come flying at this gold foil. And a lot of them pass through completely undeflected because they don't touch anything. The nucleus of an atom is very small and the particles that make up x-rays are even smaller than that. Okay? So they went right through. Okay? Passed right through with no problem. But a few of them got deflected. Okay? And that's what proved that there was that this small nucleus existed in there. If the nucleus was big, they'd have all come straight back. Okay? But the nucleus was very small, so some of them only caught part of it and were only partially turned, okay, changed directions a little bit, and hit all these different places on the gold foil. Okay? Very few of them came all the way back. All right? If none of them come back, then that means that the nucleus or the atom is very, very small, and there's a lot of space in between them. Everybody follow the logic there? Okay? He was fully expecting everything to go right through, all right? but it didn't. Right. So, again, proved by accident, okay, something very important, the idea of this nucleus. All right. And it was from there okay, that the whole nuclear science and nuclear physics kind of came to be. Because right. now, now that we knew what the atom s structure was sort of like, we could look at ways to break them. Okay. Unfortunately, man is destructive, and when we find stuff out, we want to find out how to break it. Okay? It's one of the first things we want to know how to do. I can build it, now I want to break it. Okay? So, how can we break the atom? Well, okay, you take really, really big atoms. So, if I've got, let's say, a nuclear reactor. In a nuclear reactor, there are what we call fuel rods. Okay? They're just a big metal rod. Okay? And they've got pellets, fuel pellets, of uranium stuck to them. Okay? What we do is we lower them down and we expose them to a beam of neutrons. Okay? We're shooting neutrons at them or particles at them. And when those particles strike the uranium, the uranium atoms are big and they're not very tightly packed or not very strongly held together. So when these photons or protons, sorry, sorry, neutrons hit them, the atom shatters. When it shatters, it releases huge amounts of energy. All right? Not each individual atom, but the many atoms that break start releasing large amounts of energy because there's a lot of energy released when you break these atoms. There's a lot of energy that holds them together, so when you break them, that energy gets released. Now, if I was to be able to split one atom here on the desk, we'd never know. Okay? Atoms are tiny. But the thing with uranium atoms is, if you break one and it shatters, the pieces of it go off and break other ones that are nearby, and you get this cascading kind of chain reaction happening. Okay? And that's what leads to, in a nuclear bomb, the giant explosion and release of energy. In a nuclear reactor, obviously you don't want that to happen. Okay? You want to control it. Okay? And so what happens is, if you start getting too much energy, you just pull the fuel rod out. Okay? And the reaction will slow down and stop. Okay? You insert it back in when you want to get the reaction going and generate more electricity. All right? Now, how does this generate electricity? It turns water into steam and the steam turns a turbine. Okay? That's all there is to nuclear power. We use nuclear power to make steam. Right. In Canada, we use coal because we have lots of it. Okay, that makes sense. Now, with a bomb, I'm going to show you how to make a nuclear bomb. Okay, pay close attention. You'll never get the opportunity to make one because you won't be able to get your hands on the stuff you need. But okay, a nuclear bomb is essentially a casing. Okay, that's supposed to look like an octagon, but I'm not a good artist. Okay, so you've got this casing. This octagon is made out of high explosive. Uh, C4, TNT, something like that. Okay? And in the middle is a big chunk of plutonium or uranium or something okay, that's radioactive like that. When you detonate the nuclear bomb, there's two explosions. One that you'll never notice, okay? and that's the shell blowing up. Okay? When the shell blows up, because of its shape, all the particles from this high explosive are directed inwards at the fissionable material, the plutonium, the uranium, whatever is in there. Okay? And that causes the same thing that lowering the fuel rod into the path of the neutrons causes. Okay? It causes these atoms to split. The difference is this one's completely uncontrolled. There's no way to stop it once it gets going. Everybody with me there? Okay? That's how a nuclear bomb works. And then you get the big kaboom after the fact. All right? Now, obviously building a nuclear bomb is a little more complex than that, but that's the general idea. Okay. All right. Now, once 
once the idea of the nucleus came about, then we were able to start picturing what do all these individual particles do. All right, we were able to start figuring out how big is a proton, how big is a neutron, how big is an electron. Okay, but the big argument was where are the electrons? People knew the neutrons and protons were big, they were stuck together, and they were in the nucleus. Okay, but there was a lot of argument about what are the electrons doing. Okay, um, they realized the electrons had to be moving, and they had to. Re they realized also that they had to be loosely attached because in chemical reactions, electrons tend to move around. Okay, that's what Thomson discovered when he discovered the electron. Okay, is that they can move, so they can't be part of the nucleus. The nucleus is always the same; it's always stuck together. Right. So some people said. Maybe it's like the solar system and the electrons orbit the nucleus like planets orbit the sun. It kind of made sense. We'd seen lots of examples of that. The moon orbits the earth, etc. Okay. Um, the problem with that is that it didn't explain the behavior of some things that were very common. For example, it didn't explain how plants can use sunlight for photosynthesis. Okay. What plants do in photosynthesis is the light strikes the chlorophyll. Okay. And the chlorophyll, obviously, is made of atoms, and they have electrons. These electrons, when the sun hits them, start to move faster. And when they move faster, they move farther away from the nucleus. Okay? If you're moving faster and farther away, do you have more energy? It takes more energy to move faster, right? It takes more energy to move away from something. Okay? So these electrons now have a lot of energy. When the sun goes down, there's nothing to keep them there. So they fall back towards the nucleus. And when they do that, they release the energy they had before. Okay? And that energy is what the plant uses to make sugar. All right, everybody follow me there. The same process is what makes stuff glow in the dark. Okay? How many people have a watch where the numbers glow in the dark? Okay? Maybe you got a shirt or something that's got like the glow in the dark stuff on it, right? You get you, you put it in the light and then you put it in the dark and it's still glowing. It's exactly the same process. The electrons gain energy from the, from the light, and they move away from the nucleus. They get excited, they go faster, and once, this, once the light is gone, they start moving back, and they release the light energy they had before. Okay? And so that thing glows for a short period of time. Right? Eventually, it, it stops. Everybody with me there? Okay? So this planets around the, the sun idea didn't explain either one of those processes. So people started coming up with other ideas. And eventually, we ended up with not the Bohr model, okay? although the Bohr model is what an atom would look like if you took a picture of it, okay? and you froze the electrons in one spot. It would probably look like this. Okay? But if you took a video of an atom, it would look like this. Okay? We call this the electron cloud, or the quantum mechanical model. Okay? And what it says is, Electrons don't have fixed orbits. They move in and out as well as around the nucleus. Okay? And that helps to explain how they can gain and lose energy and power certain biological processes like photosynthesis. Okay? So in de Broglie's model, okay, the electrons can jump or fall from one level to another depending on the energy of the atom. Okay, and that's that's why we generally now accept the electron cloud model okay, as the true model of the atom. Okay. Um, and this is kind of another idea of what that quantum mechanical or electron cloud model looks like, right? The atom you know, is, is all of this space, but most of it is empty. Okay? Electrons are very small, and they're always moving. So when Rutherford shot those x-rays at the gold foil, those x-rays that went through were passing through these places here, where there's nothing. The ones that got deflected were hitting the nucleus and getting shot off in another direction. All right. For structure of the atom, okay, obviously the neutrons and the protons are in the nucleus. The electrons are on the outside. How do I determine the number of protons in the nucleus? How do I find that out? Uh, no, because atoms are electrically neutral. They're always going to have the same number of electrons as they have protons. Otherwise, they're not an atom. They're an ion. Okay. 
What you do is you look at your periodic table, and I will give you one of these next week. Okay? You look at your periodic table, and you look at the atomic number. Okay? The atomic number is the number of protons in the nucleus of the atom. All right? So every calcium atom has 20 protons. It also has 20 electrons. The neutrons are different. Okay? The bigger an atom gets, the more neutrons it has. And it can have more neutrons than protons, a lot more. Okay? It's also possible for it to have less neutrons than it has protons. It does happen. All right? Now, this number, again, tells me the number of protons. It tells me the number of electrons. If I want to calculate the number of neutrons, I have to use the atomic mass, this number here, and the atomic number. And I subtract them. Okay? So I subtract. Let's say we're doing this for, uh, for lithium. Okay? Lithium's atomic mass is 6.94. Okay, and its atomic number is 3. All right, so 6.94 minus 3 is 3.94. All right, can you have 0.94 neutrons? So it's probably that it actually doesn't have 3.94, but it has 4. Okay, so lithium has 4 neutrons, 3 protons, 3 electrons. Okay, so you might want to write down, okay, number of protons equals the atomic number, okay, number of electrons equals the atomic number, okay, and the number of neutrons Okay, the number of neutrons is calculated by subtracting the atomic number from the atomic mass. No, it can't be a negative. The atomic mass is always bigger than the atomic number because the atomic mass includes protons, neutrons, and electrons. Okay, so no, you'll never get a negative number. Okay, is it possible to get zero? Yes. Okay, hydrogen is a prime example of that. Okay, hydrogen only has one proton and one electron, has no neutrons. Okay, one minus one is zero, has no neutrons. Okay, but it will never be negative. All right, and we've already talked about this here, how every, uh, every element has a different number of okay, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Okay, so uh, we're done with that part. So what I'm going to do here, guys, is I've got a question sheet. Okay, I want you to answer the questions that are on it using the notes from this lesson. All right, if you don't have the notes package with you, okay, then use your phone to look at the online version. Okay.